لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, which is a greeting of peace, peace be unto you. Thank you for tuning into another episode of The Dean Show. We are here trying to help you understand Islam and Muslims. Now, my next guest, who is coming out in a minute, he's been with us before. He has a special section at thedeanshow.com. You can hear his story and how he embraced Islam, amongst other top topics that we've done with him. Now, we are going to be talking about Muslims in America, American history with Muslims. Now, just to note, we're going to be using the word Islam. By now, many viewers who've been with us, you know what this word means. Simply surrender, submission, obedience, doing all this sincerely to the one God, the one God who created the sun, the moon, and everything in this universe. And that's easily summed up with one word in Arabic, which is Islam. And a Muslim is one who does this action. The action of submitting and surrendering, sincerely being obedient to the one God who created everything in this universe. It's much easier summed up with one word, Muslim. How long have these Muslims who implement Islam been in America? And that's what our next guest, Dr. Gerald Dirks, is going to help answer when we come back here on The Dean Show. You don't want to go nowhere. Allah, there's only one God, and Muhammad is his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. Allah, there's only one God, and Jesus was his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamu alaikum. And peace and the mercy of God be upon you. And you too, my brother. How are you? Good, good. It's good to have you with us here on the Dean Thank Show. You. We've covered quite a few topics with you before. For those of our viewers who don't know who you are, just take a minute and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I converted to Islam in 1993, did the uh, Hajj uh, pilgrimage in 1999. Prior to that, uh, I'd practiced for a number of years as a psychotherapist. I have a doctorate in clinical psychology. But before that, uh, I was an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church, having received a Master of Divinity degree from Harvard Divinity School. Did Christopher Columbus discover America, or did Muslims discover America? Let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about this history with Muslims in America. Well, it, it's kind of ironic to say someone discovered America when American Indians were already here. Um, <laughs> But this issue of Muslims in American history is, is a very important issue. And why, to, why, why is it so important? Why well, let, let me illustrate it with a story. Uh, it was a year before 9-11. Yes. And my wife and I were standing at our local Midwestern airport located right on the buckle of the Bible Belt, waiting for our luggage to come down the conveyor belt. And a gentleman across the way, oh, maybe 20 feet, 30 feet away, happened to glance over and he saw my long, unruly beard, and he saw my wife wearing her scarf and her long outer garment, and he did sort of a double take, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, and then over the course of the next five minutes, he sort of slowly meandered across the space until he was standing right next to me. And at that point, he turned to me and he said, where are you from? <laughs> And I said, well, I'm from 35 miles north of here. And he said, no, 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 no. I mean, where are you from originally? <laughs> and I said, well, I was born 30 miles north of here. And at that, sort of a puzzled, confused look crossed his face, and he started to turn and walk away. And then you could just see the light bulb going on over his head. And he turned back to me with this look of triumph on his face, pointed to my wife and said, well, where is she from? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, she was born 40 miles north of uh, here. You see what he was trying to do, brother? He had correctly identified us as being Muslims. And because he had made that identification, he was going to rob us of our American identity and our American heritage. And in doing so, he was reflecting a myth that is very, very common amongst the American public. And that is 
that Muslims uh, came first to America in the latter half of the 20th century, that somehow Muslims are Johnny-come-latelys mm -hmm. on the American scene. The truth of the matter, however, is far, far different than that. We Muslims have been here long before the latter half of the 20th century. We Muslims helped tame and settle the American Wild West in the latter half of the 19th century. We Muslims fought to preserve the Union in the American Civil War between 1861 and 1865. We Muslims stood armed and ready to defend the American coastline from British invasion in the War of 1812. We Muslims fought to secure American independence from Great Britain during the American Revolutionary War. We Muslims built the agricultural base of the American South long before there ever was a United States of America. We Muslims were here in the early part of the 17th century in the British colony at Jamestown. We Muslims were here in the latter part of the 16th century in the Spanish colonies. We Muslims were here with the Spanish conquistadors in the early part of the 1500s. We Muslims were here with Columbus in 1492. And yes, we Muslims, even though this is a little controversial, we Muslims were here long before Christopher Columbus ever thought of coming to America. Amazing. Tell us now, I want to just go backwards at the airport. You were doing nothing, minding your own business, but was it because now we see a lot of Muslims, and we addressed this in previous shows, mm -hmm. the beard. Yeah. So you had the, you said the ruly beard. The long, unruly beard. And now your wife. Wearing who, the scarf. Which if you look back, A, with the beard, in any picture that is portrayed of supposedly Jesus, he has a beard, doesn't he? In most of them. Pictures of him as a youth obviously do not. Or most of, even if you look at the Ten Commandments with Moses, he had a beard, didn't he? Well, that's how artists how they try to say, yeah. yeah, represent him. And if you look back to some of the modest women, if you look at who supposedly Jesus' mother, what they have portrayed of her in sure. a picture, you will see her wearing the the uh, headscarf. Sure, sure. And many of the righteous women, you'll see them pres preserving their modesty wearing this. And that's all. That's that, correct. You know, so this is just amazing. Now, tell us, continue on. How come most of us, we don't really get to know this? This is a shock to a lot of people that are listening. You know, why is this? Well, it's because knowledge is so compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. Unless you read Arabic or have access to someone who reads Arabic, and you go back to these very early Arabic books, you won't find this information. But if you do go back and you read Arabic or have access to someone who reads Arabic, you go back to these early books, you find that there were a number of voyages from the Muslim world to the Americas long before Columbus. In fact, the earliest of these was Kashkash ibn Said ibn Aswad, who sailed from Muslim Andalusia, what is now Spain, Portugal, in the year 889. 600 years before Columbus, wow. sailing west across the Atlantic, discovering a new land, apparently islands in the Caribbean, and sailing back to Andalusia. About a hundred years later, Ibn Farouk in the year 999 made a similar voyage from Muslim Andalusia to the New World. You said Ibn, what does that mean for... Uh, son of. Son, son of. of. Yeah, son of Farouk. Son of Farouk, that would be his father, okay. Yeah, and then... Uh, Al-Idrisi, famous Muslim geographer and scientific advisor to the king of Sicily uh, in the uh, 12th century, wrote about a group of eight Muslim sailors that sailed west across the Atlantic uh, from Muslim Andalusia, or Spain, Portugal, arrived at two new islands, uh, hitherto unknown to them, and uh, there they were captured by American Indians and held captive for a few days. And after two or three days, another Indian came who served as translator mm -hmm. between the Indians and these Muslims from Andalusia. And he arranged for their release and they went back to uh, Andalusia. Now, the, the important thing in this story is to stop and think for a moment. Wait a minute. There's an American Indian who can serve as translator? There's an American Indian who has had enough contact with Muslims that he can speak Arabic 
and serve as a translator. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we have these stories from uh, written and very early Arabic books detailing these three voyages from Muslim Andalusia. But it's not just from Muslim Andalusia. It's also from what today we call Morocco. For example, uh, Sheikh Zain ad-Din Ali ibn Fadl al-Mazarandi sailed west from Morocco across the Atlantic in the year 1291, reached the New World. And perhaps the most impressive of all is sailing from West Africa, the Mandinka Kingdom of Mali. Uh, around the year 1310, the sultan or king of that empire named Abu Bakari sent two expeditions west across the Atlantic. Now, Columbus sailed in 1492 with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. From what is documented in the ancient Arabic books, Abu Bakari sent two fleets which together totaled 2,200 ships. Mm -hmm. So this was a huge amount of men moving west across the Atlantic. And we know they reached the Americas. They never returned, but we know they reached the Americas because there is a South American Indian tribe which even to today uses Mandinka ideograms as their form of written communication. There's a North American Indian tribe whose syllabus of words was written down by a Moravian missionary in the mid-1700s. And when modern linguists look at that syllabus, they discovered a large number of those words are Mande, the language of the Mandinka of Western Africa. Mm -hmm. So they obviously made it to the Americas, explored parts of South America and North America, intermarried with the American Indian tribes, and gradually their history was lost. But they were here, and they were here almost two centuries before Columbus. So yes, we Muslims were here before Columbus. You mentioned that if you don't have access to some of the Arabic uh, books on history, or do you find this in some of the uh, history writings here in America, like when you were attending university at Harvard? Will you see this information there? No, no. This sort of information, again, is too compartmentalized. Uh -huh. People who are writing about American history typically don't read Arabic. Yeah. Um, the person who did the pioneering work on uh, Muslims in America before Columbus was uh, Dr. Abdullah Hakim Quick, yeah. who is fluent in Arabic uh, and who has a, a PhD in history, by the way. So he, he went and looked at this authentic information yes. and this was documented and now anybody who is a, a, a sincere historian now he can take from this work that he's done? Yeah, it's, uh, it's beginning to receive some notice. It's, okay, so let's go back to what we said. Why is this so important to say for the Muslim youth to know this history? Crucial for the Muslim youth to know this history. Or not even just the Muslim youth, for Americans in general. Well, crucial for them to realize that Muslims have been here all along and that Muslims have made contributions to America all along. But especially for the second generation of Muslims in America, this is a most important piece of information. Because as they hit adolescence, they're struggling to develop their own sense of identity. Mm -hmm establishing their national cultural identity as Americans mm -hmm. and establishing their religious identity as Muslims. Mm -hmm. And when you meet or are confronted by this sort of bias that says, well, if you're a Muslim, you obviously can't be an American, yeah. that creates conflict for them. That creates identity conflict for them. So it's important that they have this grounding and understanding their own unique heritage in America that... Uh, Muslims centuries before them uh, were contributing to America. Tell us some more uh, interesting things that we probably didn't hear before about some of the other contributions that Muslims mm -hmm. have made to America. Well, as I mentioned, Muslims were here with Columbus in uh -huh. his epic voyage in, 19, in 1492. Amongst them, uh, we can point to uh, at least one Muslim who was uh, Pedro Alonso Nino. Mm -hmm. He was a Muslim from Africa, sailed with Columbus, uh, and helped charter and navigate much of the Atlantic Ocean. But three very important people we need to point out are the Pinzon brothers. Mm -hmm. And the Pinzon brothers were Moriscos. Now that's a term that needs some definition. Most people probably are not familiar with that term. In 1492, the Spanish Inquisition was going on full blast. 
And the Spanish Inquisition targeted both Jews and Muslims for their persecution. Let's stop for there and, and digress. What was this about, the Spanish Inquisition, just in short? Ferdinand and Isabella, yeah. their Catholic majesties of Spain, had reconquered Spain from the Muslims with the fall of Granada in 1492. And they had received a special bull, that's the technical term, from the Pope to launch the Spanish Inquisition to force people to convert to Christianity, both Jews and Muslims. A lot of torture went on. A lot of uh, people were killed in the process of doing this, both Jews and Muslims. Mm -hmm. At that time, the Muslims in Andalusia, or Spain, received a, a religious verdict from scholars in North Africa that said, look, if your life is threatened, go ahead and undergo a sham conversion to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And on the outward side, appear to be Christian, just continue to practice your Islam and This is if you're at the sword, yeah, at your neck, and you're if your life is threatened. So a number of Muslims did this. Mm -hmm. uh, and these Muslims who did this and their descendants were known as Moriscos. Mm -hmm. So we have the three Pinzon brothers with Columbus. They're Moriscos. Um, now the three brothers had very important positions in Columbus's expedition. Martin Pinzon was the captain of the Pinta, one of the three ships. His brother Vicente was captain of the Nina, the second of the three ships. And Francisco was the pilot of the Pinta. So three key positions in Columbus's staff were held by Moriscos, mm -hmm. people who had either undergone a sham conversion or were the descendants of people who had undergone the sham conversion to Christianity but continued to maintain their Islam in private. In addition, one sailor that sailed with Columbus in 1492, Rodrigo de Triana, who was a Christian when he made the voyage, as soon as he got back to Spain, he actually converted to Islam which took a tremendous amount of courage because the Spanish Inquisition, like I say, was going full tilt mm -hmm. and persecuting uh, Muslims and Jews. So these are the people we know of that sailed with Columbus uh, and helped Columbus, quote unquote, discover America. Mm -hmm. Please keep, keep on going. We're really intrigued by okay. this information. Well, and after Columbus, we had Muslims coming with the Spanish conquistadors because mm -hmm. again, that Spanish Inquisition was still going on. And many, many Muslims volunteered to go to the New World as a way of escaping the Spanish Inquisition. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we have Muslims in almost every one of the uh, Spanish uh, expeditions uh, to the New World by the conquistadors. Nuflo de Olano was a Muslim who accompanied Balboa in his expedition of the Americas. But probably the most famous of these Muslims with the Spanish conquistadors was Estevanica of Azamor. That's how you'll find his name written in the history books. And he is famous. Spanish language films have been made about Estevanico of Azamor. He was a Muslim. He was a Muslim. His real name was Mustafa Zamori. Uh -huh. uh, Estevanico of Azamor was his slave name. Uh -huh. He had been captured in Morocco and enslaved. And in uh, the year 1527, he uh, sailed with his owner from Spain to the Caribbean and landed in uh, Hispaniola. And there he and his owner joined the Dinarves expedition that sailed from uh, Hispaniola in the Caribbean to Florida. Mm -hmm. And this expedition consisted of five ships and about 500 to 600 men. Well, a long route, they were hit by a hurricane. Some of the ships sank. The survivors, when they made it to Florida, were immediately attacked by Indians, many of them perishing. Those survivors, including Mustafa, began a 5,000 mile westward and then southern trek on foot from Florida to Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And they were the first people from the old world to go through you know, Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and uh, then down into Texas and finally down into Mexico and to Mexico City. And when they finally arrived there, there was only Mustafa and three others still left alive mm -hmm. out of those 500 to 600 who had begun that expedition. 
History books talk about him, mm -hmm. but they'll talk about him as Estevanico of Azamor. They won't mention that his real name was Mustafa Zamori, and they won't mention the fact that he was a Muslim. Yeah. What about Kunta, Kunta Kinte? Well, this is later. Yeah. Uh, he, he obviously wasn't there with conquistadors. But before we get to the conquistadors, or get to Kunta Kinte, you know, Muslims were here with, with the early colonies. Mm -hmm. The uh, Spanish established a colony uh, early on at Santa Elena back in the year 1566. And many of the colonists that they took uh, were from the Galician mountain areas of Spain and Portugal, which was an area that was very, very densely populated mm -hmm. by Muslims. So it's a very safe assumption. We had a number of Muslims in the Santa Elena colony, which was located in the southeastern, what is now the United States. We also know that Spain settled Turkish Muslims, both in uh, Cuba and Mexico, and in the southwestern United States. These were primarily Turkish Muslims who were silk and textile workers. Mm -hmm. And in Jamestown Colony that the British established, again we had Turkish Muslims who were brought into the colony, again primarily silk and textile workers. And in fact they became so numerous in Jamestown Colony that Virginia actually passed a law prohibiting any more Turks and Muslims from entering the Jamestown colony. Mm -hmm. And the first written record we have of those Muslims being there is from the year 1631. So again, very substantial contributions. You mentioned Kunta Kinte. Yes. Very famous in Alex Haley's book, Roots. Yeah, they actually have a new revised uh, DVD or movie that one can see yeah. and watch that it was really and, good. And the, the miniseries that was the mini -series, broadcast that's right. years ago really doesn't mention the fact that he was a Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, if you are a Muslim and you know what to look for, you can deduce it. But the book makes very, very clear that Kante Kinte was a Muslim. In the Americas, both North and South America, during this unforgivable period of human slavery, there were approximately 20 million enslaved Africans that were brought to the Americas. Of these, current historians are now estimating between 20 and 30 percent were Muslims. Mm -hmm. So between four and six million enslaved African Muslims mm -hmm. were brought to the Americas. Many of them highly educated. Some with the equivalent of PhD degrees from the University of Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. And historians are now finding in little county museums in the American South entire books written in Arabic by these enslaved African Muslims. Wow. The entire Quran written from memory in Arabic. Entire books of Islamic jurisprudence written from memory in Arabic. So a very educated group of people, and some modern historians are now positing that the percentage of literacy among the enslaved Africans in the American South was actually higher than the percentage of literacy among the slave owners. Mm -hmm. It's just that the slaves literacy was in Arabic, not in English. Yeah. So who were some of these Muslim slaves? One was Kante Kente. Yes. And Kante Kente uh, grew up in, uh, well, he was born around 1750 mm -hmm. in Jafur in West Africa and what is now Gambia. When he was a, a teenager, he went out to, uh, into the jungle to get some wood to make a drum. And at that point, he was captured and enslaved, taken to the coast, and put on board a ship, the Lord Ligonier, and uh, transported to the Americas. And, and how horrible these conditions were on the ship. These people were chained in a uh, uh, reclining position where they were lying down, body next to body, and kept in this position throughout almost the entire voyage. How long would a voyage take? Oh, it could take a couple of months. Wow. Uh, and they were given, you know, a, a bare minimum of food and water. The conditions, sanitary conditions, as you can imagine, were horrible. Yeah. There were no bathroom breaks. You know, you just stayed in that position. How bad was it? Well, on the ship that Kunta Kunta came over on, we're told that approximately 30% of those enslaved Africans died during the voyage to the Americas. Well, Kunta Kinte reached the Americas and was sold at auction. Uh, 
to John Walker or Waller of Spotsylvania County. And Kunta Kente uh, could not adjust to being a slave. Mm -hmm. And so he repeatedly tried to escape. And finally, to prevent him from escaping anymore, uh, Waller had one of his feet amputated. Mm -hmm. And at that point, then, he was sold to Waller's brother, who was a, a more, somewhat more compassionate slave owner. He later married a father to daughter named Kizzy, mm -hmm. who was sold away mm -hmm. from the family to another owner. That owner raped Kizzy, producing a son called Chicken George. Uh -huh. And there's a photograph of Chicken George, taken late in his life as an old man, that shows him sitting down, and he's wearing the kufi, the skull cap associated with the Muslim, and the thobe, or, or long gown associated with Muslim men. So we know Kunta Kente was able to pass along at least some of his Islam to his daughter, and she in turn some of it to her son. Mm -hmm. So Kunta Kente, probably the most famous of the enslaved uh, African Muslims in America. Though in my book, Muslims in American History, I give the biographies, I think of about 30 of these enslaved African Muslims so, that made it to the United States. So which one of your books, is this the one that people now who really want to know more about Muslims in America, they can find that history here in your book, Muslims, Muslims in American, American History, history a Forgotten, or forgotten Legacy. Legacy. Yes. Okay, yeah, so, and they can see this book at Dirk's Online Books? Dirk's Online Books .com, yes. Okay, and amongst other books, you have written how many books total? Uh, six, and then I wrote five chapters in a seventh book. Yeah, if you can give some of uh, the audience some closing remarks regarding the conclusion of this topic and some advices, and they can also learn more. Yeah, there, there's a lot more to be said about America, uh, Muslims and American history. We've only just started scratching the history of the earliest part of that history. Mm -hmm. Yet to be said is the, the Muslims who fought in the American Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the American Civil War, um, and those who helped tame and settle the American Wild West. So there's a very rich, rich history here of Muslims in America yeah. contributing to America, and that goes back centuries. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a long-standing Muslim American heritage that people do need to be aware of. We didn't just arrive yesterday. We didn't. We've been here all along. And I'm sure there's many others who maybe had interaction with Muslims who, because like we said, a Muslim is one who makes a conscious decision yes. to surrender and submit to the one God and agree that Muhammad was the last and final messenger sent to mankind. That's correct. Then confirming Jesus is a messenger, Abraham, Moses, and all the other messengers. That's right. It's something very simple. Thank you for being My with pleasure. us. My pleasure. I'd like to thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Dean Show. You can learn more. Muslims in America, the history of forgotten legacy, and you can go to our brother's website, that's Dirk's Online Books, to read more on this topic. I hope that you got to benefit and learn something new, and we will hopefully see you again next week here on The Dean Show. Until then, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. The DVDs for Dawah, as Allah has said in the Quran in Surah Naho 16.125, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati, invite all to the way of your Lord with wisdom, beautiful preaching, and reason with them in ways that are best. And this is a great opportunity for you to take up the obligation, take up the call, as Allah has told you to do, and share this beautiful message with the world, Islam, submission to the one God. Come and see what everyone's talking about. If you find one contradiction, it can't be from God. But the rational idea, the rational explanation is, you do your best. Give up worshiping God is one. I will never give up spreading this message. I hope that you take that necessary step. You don't know if you're going to live till tomorrow. So you got to find that urgency to do the right thing right now. If you say that you do not believe in Jesus, you have stepped outside of Islam. You cannot be a Muslim. It is a tenet of our faith to... It's cold, it's late, everybody's sleeping. I arise and ask Allah to forgive me. Oh Allah, you see. Oh Allah, you know all the sins I do.
I turn to you to forgive my sins and my heart. I'm your sinful slave. You're my loving Lord. I'm the one who runs away. Oh, Allah, guide me.